Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. I hope you had a chance to rest at least a little bit over spring break. Today, we're going to get straight back into things, and we're going to talk about the cheery topic of divorce. But before we get to that, let's review a little bit. Before break, we talked about the hazards of single life and the fact that being single as opposed to being in a couple or if not a couple in some sort of relationship or marriage is often seen as a personal deficiency that people have to account for even when they're dating and talking to other people who are single. And this is true of really any kind of non-normative or non-conforming, culturally unintelligible life. If you're not living your life according to the usual script, for example, of a typical life course, then usually you will find yourself with a lot to explain to other people all the time, which, if nothing else, can be very, very tiring. But it's important to note that while marriages can provide security and comfort and a sense of normalcy and transitioning into adulthood properly, they can also provide agony and humiliation, as we saw in the case of For example, first wives in Tajikistan who found themselves divorced in favor of newer Russian second wives. We also saw this in the case of polyandry amongst the Nyimba and specifically younger brothers discontent with a wife who is older than them, who they didn't choose for themselves, who they might not have a great relationship with. And... Ideally, marriages expand social worlds, but they can just as frequently be experienced as confining obligations. On the one hand, when you get married, you perhaps have opportunities to be mobile, to go new places, you get connected to new groups of people, but then you have to also live up to whatever being a husband or a wife or a spouse is supposed to be. So, because of the fact that not every marriage goes well, cross-culturally, historically, divorce has virtually always existed, although different societies have had different rules and norms about it, obviously in terms of how accepted it is, how easy it is to do, and so on. Social and legal frameworks can make a divorce more or less difficult, and by this I don't mean just things like stigma around divorce, but I also mean things like, is your society matrilineal versus patrilineal? If you have a matrilineal society, divorce tends to be easier. If you have a patrilineal society, you have this conflict where the wife who's leaving leaves the patriline, goes back to her family, but who do the children belong to? Do they belong to the patriline or the matriline? Um, In matriline, if the man leaves the matriline, the wife and the children just stay there. So you don't have like custody issues in the same way. Um, Also with matriline, uh, women, you know, they have their own houses and their own property. And so they don't have to worry about finding some place to live and also look for a job and also take care of their kids. It just makes divorce easier in lots of ways. Um, And I think I already covered this question of subsistence patterns and property holding. Again, where women hold property, divorce is easier. Industrialization um, has also had an effect on divorces. We see um, increased mobility, individualization, and a greater emphasis on love marriage. And as we know, that's unstable. And in fact, we accept the instability 
when confluent love is your framework for love, then you expect your relationships to be fragile and you expect to have many of them rather than one across a lifetime. So let's talk specifically about Japan. First of all, this is just a trend around the world. Macro social research suggests that as people prioritize independence and individuality, divorce rates will rise. This corresponds very nicely with what Giddens says, right? That confluent love is about two people who don't need each other coming together because they want to be together in this so-called pure relationship. But this pure relationship is fragile and can only last for as long as people want to be together because independence and individuality is part of what underpins this idea of love. And we can see this happening in 21st century Japan. It's obvious from looking at the way matchmakers talk about relationships because they are very confused by the society around them that promotes marriage as a love relationship as opposed to promoting it as a kind of social insurance, having extended kin ties to help take care of you, having extended kin ties for financial security, having children so someone can take care of you when you're old. And they argue that it doesn't make sense to get married to somebody before you know what their job is, what their income is, what their family is like. If you go through a matchmaker, this is something that's in everybody's profile. You know how much money they make, um, what their social background is like, and you know, they think you need to know that first before you even think about whether or not you like a person. You have to know if they're the kind of person who can help you live the life you want to live. And more generally in Japan right now, emotional and family dependence, needing other people is seen as a threat to real love, which is starting to resemble this pure relationship, confluent love. And individualist and romantic ideas have been gaining traction steadily ever since dating was introduced as a practice at the end of the Second World War. This is a huge change for Japan in actually a very short amount of time. So if we look at research on how people conceptualize themselves in Japan in the 1980s, um, Doreen Kondo has written about this very eloquently. Um, her discussion of the Japanese self is one of selves who are bound up in networks of dependence and mutual obligation. And, you know, 40 years later, totally different. Totally, totally different. Neoliberal, all about individual responsibility. So as you can probably imagine, all of these concrete changes in Japanese social life more broadly have had an effect on marriage and divorce in Japan. For one thing, um, going along with this idea that individuals should receive compensation as opposed to households. Um, and I remember this very clearly because this happened right after I moved to Japan. There were changes in pension laws that have led to an increase in divorce specifically amongst um, retired people because women are now able to receive a share of their husband's pensions. The idea was that the husband worked for the household and then in the husband's name, the household received the pension. But now the logic is that women being at home was what allowed their husbands to work long hours and earn that pension. So women should get to keep part of that pension even if they leave the household, even if they divorce. These changes have paralleled other social changes where the government has stepped in to provide services that used to be something that families were responsible for. So childcare is something that the state provides now through public childcare facilities. Um, elder care is something that is being more medicalized rather than being done at home. Moreover, 
as women joined the workforce in Japan and the Japanese government, um, especially under Shinzo Abe, at least nominally <laughs> wanted to encourage women's active workforce participation, women and men no longer need each other economically and socially. They can support themselves as individuals. Finally, ideologies of independence and confluent love have arrived in Japan and are changing expectations about how partners should treat each other. Some people think this is terrible. For example, the feminist sociologist Ueno Chizuko wrote um, in the 90s, this was a while ago, but she wrote that Japan is lovesick and that this emphasis on romance and personal satisfaction is actually the enemy of community. It's pretty dramatic. Precisely because ideas have been changing in Japan, this article, which is from 2011, um, is a really good look at how people are articulating some conflicting ideas with some people being attached to new ideas, some people hanging on to older ways of doing things. So on the one hand, being independent and having a more pure relationship, I don't really like that term, um, but it is Giddens' term. Having a more pure relationship can allow partners to treat each other as equals instead of subordinating the wife to the husband, leaving her unhappy, um, treating her needs and desires as less important than her husband's. That should be pretty self-evident. Divorce can also be seen as a way for women to restore their self-concepts, especially if you've been married for a long time. How do you know who you are as a single person as opposed to who you are as somebody's wife or somebody's mother? Being on your own can be a way to rediscover that. On the other hand, having a man be dependent on you for some things is still appealing to some women. And, you know, they express to Alexi, the researcher, that it's really nice to be needed. There is a certain value in complementary incompetence where the men know how to do some things, the women know how to do other things, and everybody needs each other, and then everybody feels needed and feels good. And Alexi connects much of the way that people determine the extent of the dependence or independence in their relationship is based on talk in the marital relationship in terms of terms of address and explicit verbal declarations of love, you know, saying I love you out loud, calling your partner maybe like you know, sweetie or some other kind of cute thing as opposed to calling your partner mother or father, right? Mother or father emphasizes the role in the family. Something more intimate emphasizes your role as lovers. And again, it, if you're lovers, there's this romantic idea that you should say it, you should proclaim your love as opposed to showing that you love somebody by always making coffee the way they like it in the morning, for example. And so as we contemplate this case study from Alice and Alexi, I want to ask you guys, and please answer this in the comments, what makes a good marriage? What makes a marriage successful? And for a lot of people, a successful marriage is a marriage that doesn't end in divorce. But is that what success is about? And if it isn't, then what other criteria could we use to judge success? Maybe successfully raising children together. And what is the role of what we say to our partners, do you think? How do terms of endearment and terms of address structure the way we think about other people and what we are to them. So thank you so much. Welcome back again, and I will talk to you next time.